a couple of key features before the event. If you're having trouble hearing the audio, or if you have any questions during the present presentation, please use the comment section underneath the video on Facebook, and we will reserve some time at the end of the presentation for Aaron to answer all questions relevant to the materials presented. For the best viewing experience for you, we recommend closing any browser sessions, programs, or tasks running in the background that could cause interruptions um, to your video feed through Facebook. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Aaron Dwicky. Hey, so thanks first off for everyone for coming tonight, and thanks to Jill for setting this up. Um, on behalf of Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, thanks for attending our session and learning more about these um, topics. So tonight we're going to talk about ACL injuries, concussions, and urgent injury access. So meaning what happens if you injure yourself on a weekend or an evening, where do you go and what do you do? So after a year of everyone Zooming for all aspects of life, thanks to COVID, you probably know how this works. But you do have the option, you can either make the slides big and look at that primarily, or you can make my face big. Um, I'd prefer if you keep my face small and in the corner, because <laughs> I'm going to make weird facial expressions, but whatever, whatever your preference is, is totally fine. Um, this topic is for you. So this is geared towards non-medical people who don't have a lot of experience with these types of injuries um, to give kind of easy to understand information about what to do if you experience one of these injuries and where to go. I'm gonna try and use really basic terminology and avoid using big medical terms. But if I slip, and I probably will, just feel free to put a comment in the chat box and Jill can shoot me a text and I can clarify what we're talking about. Um, this talk is really to help parents, athletes, and non-medical people understand these conditions a bit better and I hope we're successful. So first a little bit of background about me and why, why am I qualified to talk to you about these topics? So I started out my medical journey as an EMT doing emergency medicine in the South Coast, Massachusetts region. I went to undergrad at Providence College in Rhode Island where I studied pre-med. I played division one soccer for Providence College women's soccer. And then I spent my junior year abroad at the University of Glasgow and played soccer over there. Um, we won a British championship was, which was the highlight of my soccer playing career. I went to the Medical University of South Carolina for my master's where I studied in the physician assistant program. And after I came back, I, I was still a little bit crazy and I hadn't quite gotten the athletic bug out of, out of my, uh, my sleeve. So I was an athlete member of the United States Skeleton and Bobsled Foundation where I participated in skeleton. So for those of you who don't know what skeleton is, it is um, like the luge, but head first. So I am qualified to talk about concussions. I'm also a former ski patroller at Atash Mountain. So the previous slide is to prove to my children that I used to be cool and I did things other than dispense snacks and drive them places. But now I have two beautiful children, Ellie and Maggie. So Ellie's my oldest, Maggie's my youngest. I started out my orthopedic journey at Boston Children's Hospital where I worked in the young adult and adolescent HIP program. Um, in everything in life, it's important to have a strong foundation. And Dr. Michael Millis and Dr. Young Joe Kim provided me that foundation. And they really gave me an appreciation and love for pediatric orthopedics and sports medicine. So thank you to both of them. I joined Plymouth Bay Orthopedics in 2015. And this has been a wonderful and collaborative organization to be a part of. And I work with Dr. Eric Reitmeyer, who's double boarded in sports medicine, as well as general orthopedics. And we, we do a lot of ACL care. Um, and we also do some concussion care as well. After I joined Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, I did specialized training in concussion to become a CIC, which is a credentialed impact consultant. As I mentioned, I'm mom to Ellie and Maggie. Hello to both of them, I think they're watching. They play soccer and ski. Our floor is always lava. There's always somebody jumping in the air and trying to avoid touching the floor. And over the course of this pandemic, they have been become experts in creative ways of injuring themselves and each other. So this topic is extremely relevant for them as well. So first we're gonna talk about ACL injuries. So the ACL is called the anterior cruciate ligament. So you can see on, on this slide right here, um, this broken fiber in the middle is supposed to represent the ACL. There's also a ligament that runs contralaterally to that called the PCL. So those are the stabilizing forces in the knee they are supposed to prevent the shin bone from sliding too far forward and help prevent hyperextending your knee along with the, AC, with the PCL. 
So who gets ACL injuries? So it's an extremely common injury. One in 3,000 people per year get this injury. This includes athletes and non-athletes. Most are actually non-contact injuries. So twisting, pivoting, stopping short, landing a jump, those are all movements that put you at increased risk of tearing your ACL. Females sustain this injury at a much higher rate than males. And female basketball players have a nearly eight times increased risk of tearing their ACL versus male basketball players. The lower the level of your sport, the higher the rate of ACL tear. So high school athletes tear their ACLs at a much higher rate than college, professional, and semi-pro athletes. So this is a video of Lindsay Vaughn tearing her ACL. So she's going to land this jump and watch her right leg crumple underneath her. Second time, just in case you missed it the first time. So this was an interesting study I found. So this study looked at 300 indoor soccer games during a seven week period. And over that time, there were 10 ACL tears. Females were eight out of 10 of those ACL tears. So there was a knee injury rate of 0.87 ACL tears per 100 player hours. And I found this extremely interesting because I'm currently playing in women's soccer league. And this women's soccer league has a lot of games at all levels that play multiple times per week. So the question becomes, is it a combination of cleats? Is it surface type? Um, what's creating this high rate of injury? And that's something that's still being studied and people are still trying to find out. So how do you know it's torn? So a lot of athletes come to us after a knee injury and they say that they felt a popping sensation in their knee. Many of them have sudden swelling as well as a feeling that their knee is not going to hold their weight and give out on them. They're often carried off to the sidelines by their teammates or coaches. If it's a high school game and there's an athletic trainer available, they may perform a sideline anterior drawer test. And if there's laxity, oftentimes they will tell the athlete that, hey, we're concerned that you may have torn your ACL, you need to see orthopedics. So what should you do next? So the key, the name of the game is rice. So rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Your goal is to minimize the amount of swelling in the joint and maintain your range of motion. We recommend getting off of your knee, limiting your activity in walking. If you have access to crutches or can borrow some, do it. Try and get, get your pressure off of that knee. Call your primary care and try and get a referral to see an orthopedist as soon as possible. A lot of people ask, should I go to the ER? You really don't need to unless your pain is out of control and your Tylenol, Motrin, ice are not taking care of it, in which case the ER can be useful. The ER is also useful if you're worried you broke something. A common misconception is some people think if they go to the emergency room, they'll get a faster MRI. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So MRIs are very rarely considered emergent and they typically need to be ordered by an orthopedist or your primary care provider. So when you come to see us first, if you haven't had them already, we'll get some x-rays. We'll make sure you haven't broken anything. We'll look at growth plates if you're a kid and you're still growing to make sure that there's no growth plate injuries. And we'll perform a physical exam. We perform specialized tests to assess for a possible meniscus tear, um, ACL tear, PCL tear. And based on our clinical suspicion from looking at your knee, we'll order more testing. In many cases, that's an MRI. And the MRI will show us soft tissues in your knee, such as the meniscus, the ACL, the PCL. Um, and it will tell us if anything's torn or damaged. Oftentimes we'll also initiate physical therapy right off the bat because that will help regain your range of motion and get down the swelling to make surgery, if you need it, a more successful outcome. And this is a picture of an MRI scanner. So you'll see the holder that the patient's leg goes in and you slide in. If you've never had an MRI, it doesn't hurt. There's no radiation. It sounds like really loud banging and it takes about 20 to 25 minutes on average. So to operate or not. So for most of our young athletes who are planning to returning to sports, they do opt to have surgery. For some of our older athletes or um, 
wannabe athletes or former athletes, they often try to treat this non-operatively, which is totally appropriate. So if you treat this non-operatively, we usually start with bracing and physical therapy. If you regain your desired level of activity and you don't feel like your knee is going to give out or be swollen or stiff, then that's fine. You don't need to pursue surgery. But a lot of our athletes come back later and say, you know what, I tried to treat this non-operatively. Every time I try to pivot or play tennis, my knee feels like it's going to give out on me. And in that case, we do talk about doing operative treatment. It's not too late at that point. So there's no um, timeline to say that if you do, don't do the surgery within two months or so that you can't do it. We can do it later as well. So if you opt for surgery, the surgery is a combination of an arthroscopy, which is looking in with a camera and assessing the inside of the joint. We clean up any torn cartilage. Um, we take away scar tissue. We clean out the stump of the ACL. And those are two small little poke hole incisions. And then there's a small incision just below that, which is about two inches long. And that allows us to put in the graft. The graft can either be um, your own tissue, for example, a hamstring autograft. So auto means self coming from you, or it can be from a cadaver. So somebody who has donated tissue. Both are successful and we do both fairly equally. So you come out of the operating room with your leg in a brace. So this is an image of Lindsay Vaughn, who's a skier who you saw in the video before. After she tore her ACL, she's put in this hinge knee brace. For the first week, your knee is kept straight, and we have you rest and ice and elevate and keep your knee straight. And then after one week, you come back. And if you've got the hinge brace, we unlock it to give you up to 90 degrees of motion. And if you're not in the brace yet, we, we put you in one. We get you fitted for that that day. So we do a total of six weeks in this hinge knee brace, and you start physical therapy one week after surgery. PT is really the mainstay of this treatment. I tell patients all the time that we get the easy part, and you have the hard part. You're going to physical therapy several times a week and you're doing exercises on a daily basis. We allow gradual return to activities based on, a post -op on your post-operative healing, as well as hitting specific rehab goals. Once we clear you to return to sports, we get you fitted for a custom ACL brace. It's a lower profile, often carbon fiber-based brace that's lightweight and sport appropriate. And that just allows you greater lateral stability when you return to your sports. So this is just a little reading list. This will be available on the website later if anybody wants to look up any of the latest and greatest literature. And now we'll have a brief intermission. So at this point, Jill's gonna read you some trivia questions. And if you get these right, you get entered into a raffle for a Dunkin' Donuts gift card. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, two questions. You can put your answers in the comment section on Facebook and just write A, B, C, or D. Um, so the first question, how many bones in the human adult body? Is it A, 106, B, 206, C, 300, or D, 205? So you can comment those. I'll give everyone a little bit of time to answer those, that question. Okay, answers are coming in. You guys are doing great. Okay, so the second question is, in the Middle Ages, what were bandages soaked in on the battlefield to create a splint for broken bones? A, cement, B, sugar water, C, horse blood, or D, ale? And for any of you texting me, trying to get me to give you the answers. <laughs> A, 
In other news, the picture on here is a picture of my four-year-old who got to the top of a chairlift and decided she needed a 15-minute nap before skiing again. What do you think, Jill? 10 more seconds? I think 10 more seconds and we'll be good to go. Also, a special thanks to Alan Doucette. He's our practice manager. He told me how to make the lighting in here. So nobody could tell I had my second COVID shot yesterday and I'm super clammy. <laughs> totally worth it though. You guys should all get your shots. All right, Jill, we ready? We're, yep. Okay, round two. So next we're gonna talk about concussion. So what is it? So this is a traumatic brain injury, TBI for short, caused by a bump, a blow, um, any trauma to your head that causes your head and brain to kind of slosh within your skull. So the sudden movement causes the brain to bounce or twist in the skull and it actually creates a chemical change in the brain. Sometimes these, so, you know, medical terms, and I know I tried, I'm trying to stay away from this. It's called a diffuse axonal injury. So these little axons, these little fibers in your brain actually get stretched. And if you get um, imaging, it actually shows light up changes on your brain after this injury. So this was actually pretty stunning to me. So almost half a million kids are treated in the emergency departments every year for concussions. That's a lot. Um, I know for any of you guys who played youth soccer in the 80s or 90s, we used to do heading drills with these really hard plastic balls. And by the end of practice, you'd have a little bit of a headache. And back then you're like, oh, whatever, you know, my brain will get tougher. And now we know we're actually causing our youth minor concussions. So we don't do this anymore. So who's at risk? So the three sports with highest concussion rates were boys football, um, understandably, girls soccer and boys ice hockey. In the community, we see a lot of work-related concussions, motor vehicle accidents, slips and falls it doesn't actually take that much impact to create a minor concussion. And there's various levels of severity and various forms of treatment, depending on how bad your symptoms are. So symptoms of con concussion. So this is a great website, by the way, it's cdc.gov slash concussion. There's a ton of resources, there's printouts, there's training for community members, teachers, coaches, um, really anyone who's interested. A lot of the state youth organizations, including um, MIAA, which is the Massachusetts Interscholastic Association, um, they have great resources and they offer training, which is often free throughout the year for anyone involved in youth sports. So the symptoms include head headache, dizziness, blurred vision, fogginess or difficulty thinking clearly, and sensitivity to noise and light. You don't have to have all of these symptoms to have a concussion. It may just be one or two. So the big, um, kind of the big trend in youth sports is to get coaches and parents trained in evaluating, doing a sideline quick evaluation for concussion. So they offer these little um, sideline concussion evaluation tools, um, including these little cards that coaches can keep in their pocket. But the mainstay of this is when in doubt, pull them out. You know, if you see an athlete who's taken a pretty big hit to the head, even if they're not endorsing symptoms, Use your best judgment, pull them out of the game, let them rest, um, evaluate them briefly on the sideline before you make a decision to return them to play. So as I mentioned before, I'm a CIC consultant, which um, means I've done specialized training in concussion evaluation and treatment. So Impact offers a program where you can actually now email links to youth sports programs um, called a baseline test. So a lot of the high schools do this already. Um, but for kids in the younger levels or club type sports, you can actually do this as part of your preseason evaluation. You can have all your athletes do baseline testing 
That way, if they do have an injury later on in the season, this is accessible by anybody who's a CIC consultant. So if you have your injury in another state and you saw somebody, they can access this. This is a nationwide program. After you've done the baseline test, if you have a concussion and you contact a CIC program, then we would do a post-injury test. So similarly, we typically email it to your house. We have you do it before you come in for the evaluation. And then there's neurocognitive testing that we do in the office. So like I mentioned, baseline testing is a way of tracking your functioning at a healthy state. It's baseline neurocognitive testing. We have pediatric certification in our office. So the normal impact test is uh, standardized for ages 12 and over. And the pediatric certification is for anyone 12 and under. They're very, they're kind of, it's kind of a fun test to take. So it measures reaction time, memory, processing speed, um, word memory. So God forbid you have a concussion and you contact a CIC specialist. It's done by a specially trained healthcare provider. MDs, PAs, nurse practitioners can all be CICs, um, but we do it as part of a team. So we also have CIC credentialed physical therapists. There are speech language, speech language pathologists who also have the certification. And we try and make treatment multidisciplinary because concussions can affect multi facets of life. So we'll help guide a safe and gradual return to activity along with symptom management. The good news is usually you don't need medication for this, except for symptomatic management for headaches, if that's one of your symptoms. So where to find concussion care? So there are CIC specialists across Massachusetts and across the country. You can go to concussioncareproviders.com. And I did a search on here that you can see. So I put in my zip code and came up with Plymouth Bay Orthopedics. And you'll notice that we have a banner for both pediatric as well as physical therapy. So we really have comprehensive availability for treatment here. So when you go on this website, you can put in your zip code and you'll find any CIC providers within whichever determined radius you need. So finally, we're gonna talk about urgent injuries. So my daughter last year was at camp and she was not paying attention, talking to a friend and walked off of a stage. She had pain, she had limping, and she had teenage counselors who were well-meaning but didn't think to tell anyone. <laughs> so what happens if this is your kid and it's Friday afternoon and you think, oh my goodness, do we need to go to the ER? Do we need to go to urgent care? Where should we go? So a reason to go to the emergency room would be, if you see the bone sticking out, please go to the emergency room. That is an emergency, you should go. Uncontrolled bleeding is obviously another one. Loss of consciousness and uncontrolled severe pain. So those are all things that need urgent, emergent treatment and you should be seen in the emergency room immediately. In urgent care, if it's after hours, if it's a weekend, if you've called your primary care and they think you need to be seen now, urgent care is appropriate. They often have lower co-pays than the emergency department but can offer um, higher level of care than the primary care office. They can help you with immobilizing or pain control until you can get to see us in orthopedics. So we are excited to offer orthopedic urgent care. So this is a program where we really try and get people in the same day or at least within 24 hours. This is increasingly offered at many orthopedic offices across the country because everybody recognizes, especially during a pandemic, it's better to keep people out of the emergency room if you can. So at least at our office, we, we offer appointments within the same day or within the 24 hours, as I mentioned. Um, it is definitely less expensive to come directly to an office than to go to the emergency room. So we hope to save you time and co-pays. Our office and many others have x-rays and casting ability right here in the office. The other benefit is we offer waterproof casting, which is something that most emergency rooms don't have, have the ability to do. We are not a walk-in um, and most urgent ortho cares are not walk-ins. So typically you do need to call your primary care and get a referral for that. But if you can wait it out, if you can rest, if you can ice, elevate, put on an ACE bandage um, until you can get in to see ortho, oftentimes just going to where they're gonna treat you definitively is the best bet. So with that being said, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we do have a drawing for a Yeti. It's a very large Yeti. <laughs> 
We're going to do a drawing from the available people who are still on the on this Zoom. So thanks for your attention and thanks for sticking it out. Jill. Okay, thanks, Erin. That was awesome. Very informative. So I do have the um, winners for the questions and the Yeti. Um, so we'll start with the question. So question one was how many bones are in the human body? Um, Aaron, do you want to tell us how many bones are in the human body? So in the average person, it is 206. Okay. So Jen Sullivan, you are the answer of a $10, um, Dunkin' Donuts gift card. So after for, I should have mentioned before for everybody who does win a prize, if you could just direct message the Plymouth Bay Facebook page, your address, and then we'll mail you your prizes directly to you. Um, so that's that one. So congratulations, Jen. Um, so question number two was what do bandages get soaked in? In the, medieval, in the medieval ages on the battlefield. Um, Aaron? So I got this one wrong when I was initially looking up orthopedic trivia questions. Um, the correct answer is horse blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's C. And I actually, let's see. I thought it was D, so I have to go back through the comments. So while we're while I'm trying to find the winner of number two, I will give the winner of the Yeti, which is so the Yeti Hayden Bagnell Petit. I believe that's how you say your last name. So Hayden, you are the winner of the Yeti. If you um could please again DM your address to the PBOA Facebook page, that would be great. Um, and number two, the question for the, sorry, the person who has the correct answer for number two is Jetta Janinski. So if you could please also do the same message your address to the Plymouth Bay Facebook page, that would be awesome. Um, and that's it. So those are our winners. Yay. Congratulations, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. So thank you, everybody. And if you do have any questions, um, for Aaron, you can message the Facebook page, or you can also go on the PBOA website um, and in the contact us field, you can submit your questions that'll be directed to me and then I can direct them to Aaron. So um, we do have a couple of questions, Aaron. Um, we do have one question if you want to sure. answer it. It's what's the best way to find a CIC? Yep, so that's that concussioncareproviders.com. And then you put in your zip code and it'll come up with anybody who has that certification near your zip code. Okay, great. Okay, I think that that does it tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us and um, be sure to keep an eye out for more PBOA speaker sessions that um, do go on throughout uh, the month and the year. So thank you. Bye guys. Have a great night.